Eleanor makes her mark. How Eleanor Roosevelt reached out, spoke up, and changed the world by Barbara Curley, illustrated by Edwin Fotheringham. The purpose of life, after all, is to live it, to taste experience to the utmost, to reach out eagerly and without fear. Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt was feeling a little nervous. In a few weeks, her husband Franklin would be sworn in as president of the United States and she would become first lady. Soon she'd be living in the White House and she needed to get ready. Eleanor told the chief usher that the inauguration ceremonies must be simple. In fact, she wanted to serve hot dogs for lunch. She toured the house from top to bottom, meeting maids and ushers, cooks, butlers, doormen, and engineers. Eleanor was counting on the White House staff to keep things running smoothly. For as First Lady, she wanted more than merely being hostess at official functions. All her life, she'd hoped to leave some mark upon the world. When she was young, Eleanor found her greatest joy in helping others. She and father served Thanksgiving dinner to newsboys who lived on the streets. With great aunt Gracie, she visited hospitalized children wearing casts and splints that looked very uncomfortable. And Uncle Valley took her to decorate a Christmas tree for families in one of the poorest neighborhoods in New York City. Each experience allowed her to meet people who, she realized, suffered in one way or another. Eleanor felt their suffering deeply for she already knew sadness. Mother made her feel too shy and solemn. Father was much more loving, but he drank heavily and was often out with friends, leaving Eleanor at home longing for his return. By the time she was 10, she had learned about loss as well. Mother, father, and her brother Elliot had all died. For the next several years, Eleanor and her brother Hall lived with their grandmother who was kind, but very strict. On Sundays, instead of playing games, Eleanor was expected to recite verses and hymns from memory. She could not lie in bed reading before breakfast, no matter how interesting the book she was that she had hidden under her mattress. Eleanor was not even allowed to choose her own clothes. She had to wear thick black stockings during long hot summers in the countryside. If she rolled them down to cool off, she was told that ladies did not show their legs and had to roll them back up again. Eleanor longed for adventure and desperately wanted to travel, but grandmother kept her close to home until she was almost 15. Finally, in 1899, grandmother decided Eleanor was grown up enough to attend Allenswood, an all-girls school in London, England. There, Eleanor's real education began. Unlike many people at that time, the headmistress, Marie Souvestre, believed that women could, could form their own opinions. Her discussions of religion shocked Eleanor into thinking, and her views on human rights inspired Eleanor's desire to work for social justice. With Mademoiselle Sylvester's encouragement, Eleanor became a leader at the school, so well liked by all the students that on Saturdays they filled her room with violets. Eleanor loved Allenswood, but when she turned 18, grandmother declared it unthinkable that she not return to New York to enter high society. For Eleanor, the departure was very hard to bear. Reluctantly, she packed her bags and headed home. By now, though, she had formed her own opinions about how to live her life. She obliged grandmother by going to fancy dances with all the other debutantes, but she also investigated the working conditions of women in garment factories and taught calisthenics to girls in a settlement house. Most debutantes, she knew, would never step foot in the tenement neighborhoods of New York, but Eleanor wanted to help and to better understand the lives of people living there. Eleanor did like one thing about being a debutante. It allowed her to get to know Franklin Roosevelt, who was charming and funny. And she liked that he admired her intelligence and her independent spirit. Soon they were engaged. 
After they married and started a family, he became a state senator for New York. Eleanor began to make her own mark in politics by listening to voters' concerns and building connections in the community. Then in 1921, Franklin contracted polio, a disease that left him unable to walk without leg braces and an arm to lean on. Eleanor helped him stay active in public life. And when he was elected governor of New York a few years later, she became his partner in the work. While Franklin toured the grounds of prisons, asylums, and hospitals, Eleanor went inside for a real inspection. She checked to see if rooms were too crowded and if the staff was kind. She even peeked into cooking pots to learn what was bubbling on the stove. When Franklin was elected president in 1932, he needed Eleanor more than ever. The country was in the midst of a tremendous crisis, the Great Depression. Millions of people were out of work. Banks and schools had closed. Families lost their homes and farmers lost their land. How could the president best help? Who could he trust to reach out to the neediest Americans and give him an honest assessment? Why, Eleanor, of course. Government, Eleanor believed, should serve the good of the people. So she encouraged everyone to write to her and share their struggles, hopes, and fears. In the mornings, she did her calisthenics. She rode her, her horse dot on the br bridal pass of Washington. Then Eleanor settled into her study with the help of her assistant, Malvina, Tommy Thompson. She tackled a mountain of work, sometimes receiving hundreds of letters a day. And if someone wrote a letter she thought especially important, in the evening, Eleanor dropped it, along with any memos she'd written in Franklin's basket for him to read. Eleanor brought important people to the White House for Franklin to meet. Women working for equal rights, students working for a better future, and African Americans working to end discrimination. But Eleanor wanted to help more people, as many as she could. To do that, she would need to learn about their lives. So she hit the road, traveling to unexpected places that the press found astonishing for a first lady. She took the mine train two miles underground to watch 400 miners dig coal. She rode in, workman's, in the workman's cage to the base of Boulder Dam. She crisscrossed the country visiting housing projects, reform schools, and jails. Not everyone applauded Eleanor's civil rights work or her efforts to help the poor. Even Franklin sometimes wished she would not push him quite so hard to do the right thing. And some people thought Eleanor should keep her opinions to herself. But that didn't stop Eleanor. Still, she gave lectures, held press conferences, made radio broadcasts, and wrote a six-a-day week newspaper column. And Tommy took dictation everywhere, in trains, in cars, and even while Eleanor was in the bathtub. Eleanor's work left its mark on the country, convincing many Americans that despite their own hardships during the Great Depression, they must look out for others as well. But in 1941, just as prospects were brightening, America faced a new crisis, World War II. While Franklin oversaw wartime strategy, Eleanor traveled to the South Pacific, visiting military hospitals from the Cook Islands to Guadalcanal. As she stopped by every bed, shaking hands with the wounded and offering comfort and thanks, she felt herself rebel at the terrible taste of war. She returned home more determined than ever to help build a peaceful world. By March of 1945, Eleanor worried about how ill and exhausted Franklin looked. She prayed she'd be able to carry on until there was peace. All she could do was make it as easy as possible for him. When he retreated to his polio center in Warm Springs, Georgia to rest, Eleanor remained behind to continue her work. She kept in touch with Franklin through phone calls and letters, delighted that he had gained a bit of weight. 
Much love to you, dear, she wrote. You sounded cheerful for the first time last night, and I hope you'll weigh 170 pounds when you return. For a few days, it seemed like Franklin might be getting stronger. Instead, on April 12th, he died. Eleanor quietly traveled to Georgia to bring his body home. Just before he was sworn in to replace Franklin as president, Vice President Harry S. Truman had asked Eleanor if there was anything he could do for her. But Eleanor, who understood the bur burden he was taking on, had replied, Is there anything we can do for you? Truman soon found the perfect answer. That December, three months after the war ended, he appointed Eleanor to serve as a delegate to the first meeting of the United Nations General Assembly, an organization founded to foster peace. And so she was able to leave her mark on the world, leading the committee that created the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a statement that championed the value of dignity of every human being and captured the spirit of an extraordinary First Lady, candid, compassionate, courageous Eleanor. How will you leave your mark upon the world? The factor which influenced me most in my early years was an avid desire, even before I was aware of what I was doing, to experience all I could as deeply as I could. Wherefore, after all, do universal human rights be where do after all, do universal human rights begin? <laughs>